We're going to do a little bit more of a hackathon. Um, we're going to do stuff together. But this time, I'm going to also demonstrate things to you. We're going to talk about experimental designs, how to do an experiment. I know some of you are very advanced, and you've done experiments, and you've published, and all of that. But I think it's good to just like align all of us to try and understand uh, that we all are on the same foundations, that we know how to do experimental design, that we know what it means to run experiments. Uh, and the hackathon will focus on how to do extensions. So given that there is a classic in the literature, what is it that we can do in order to extend it? Right? But first, in order for me to be able to show you experimental design, you have to take part in a survey. So just like two weeks ago, I asked you five minutes of your time to go on this link or just, uh, yeah, I think you can see it. Um, so this is the link mgto.org, which is my website slash 610, which is our course, uh, week four. Or you can just like scan this. There are three parts to it. Overall, very short. As you're going through this and answering this, Try and think, what is the experimental design? What is the research question? What are the hypotheses? Don't fight me. Don't like uh, give clever answers or do something out of the ordinary. A answer as if this is you participating in a survey, but try and reconstruct what the experiment is about so that we can talk about it, that we can see um, what's going on in there and learn from it. Quick discussion. What did you just go through? What did you see in the survey? Can you share a little bit with me? Had three parts. What is the first part? Replication assessment. Yeah, replication assessment. Which one is the target? What is the target? Inside bias. Inside bias, yes. Fischoff, 1975. Good. What was the second one? Outcome bias. Thank you. Um, Baron Baron and Hershey, 1988. So I asked you, based on all the cool stuff we did last week, try and assess what do you think about the replicability. Um, and the third part is an experiment. What was the experiment? What is there? There's a scenario describing what? A oh, man. Who frequently visit store A, but then he hears that they utilize the door B as the one that yeah, have a change. Right. And then at the end, he uh, ran into a robbery and got shot and lost. Yeah, stuff. right. So this is a robbery scenario where somebody got hurt uh, going into a store. And there's actually two stores, store A and store B. Store A visited frequently, store B not so much. And then he either he goes to like one of those and then something bad happens, right? Yeah. Um, all right. So looking at what we've done with um, last week, I don't know if you remember uh, this, uh, PTSD, have a look. This is what we uh, did, you did. So. What we had is assessing study credibility. We had all sorts of different uh, factors. You can see uh, Christy and Lily um, helped us to clean this up a little bit. So now it's pretty uh, organized, still needs a little bit of work, but you can see we also had a clear uh, writer. So who did uh, every part and uh, which allowed us to do the contribution. So who contributed uh, the most to both the writer and the verifier. So after each hackathon, I tried to get in like an assessment, like who collaborated the most, who contributed the most. I know it's not that clean, but it helps like give a, a little bit of um, an assessment for me. And then later, if somehow one of the hackathons kind of leaves, uh, leads to a publication, then uh, we'll try and kind of like group these into the top contributors and the least contributors so that we'll have a little bit of, of, of an order there. So I'm just like, contribute if you can. We'll try and keep uh, um, track of this. In addition, we added another interesting thing over here, aside from uh, splitting the verifiers, we also had a, a bunch of rows. 
So Christy here had a column, added a column to each one of you, and then I'll send this to you. And later I'll ask you to give me your importance from zero to 10. So you'll see that uh, Christy and Lily already uh, added a little bit. I started, but then I like stopped midway, but they added a little bit. And then finally what we'll have at the end is an important score that aggregates all of our impressions together in order to try and say here in 6010, this is what we feel about credibility. So usually in a hackathon, we'll start something in the classroom to get you thinking about something, get you playing uh, with things, getting you talking to your classmates. Then um, we're going to like summarize what have we learned. And then afterwards, like a week or two, I will ask you to do an additional stage and then hopefully get this to uh, be a real uh, coding sheet. Yeah, so we'll have a little bit more of that uh, later. Don't worry about this now. I just want to tell you that I think it's great that we were able in our first hackathon to do all of this. And then at the end, if we have like the importance of all of that, that would be an amazing uh, thing that came out of this uh, class then you can use this if you want to code whatever literature you're using whenever you need to make a decision whether you want to build um, on some foundations this is this would be a good a good start what i usually do after we have like a decent output i go on twitter and say this is what the hku students did who wants to join us and then they'll add some things we'll add more columns we'll do this a little bit more collaborative and then hopefully us together with the world uh, will get to something that would be worthy of a submission and a manuscript. Yeah, any questions about this? I just wanna say it was, it was an interesting exercise for me and it was really interesting for me to see you all uh, work together. I hope we can do more of that today. All right. So we talked about uh, fish off, um, Huntside bias and Baron and Hershey outcome bias. So this is the article. Have you heard of Bauer Fischoff before? Who heard about this guy before? Only judgment and decision-making people, right? If you've heard of the Kahneman Tversky folks, uh, Bauer Fischoff is from that generation. Also used to be at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, so I kind of like know the department or what's happening there. Um, so it's interesting how strong of a group uh, that is. Not many. Um, so it's it's very, very prolific. He's, I think, uh, late 70s. So already Emiratus, but very, very active. So even though he is supposed to be retired, he is nothing but. And actually, of all the replications that we ever ran, he's the one who by far responded the fastest. <laughs> Every time I send a, a message, I almost immediately get something back. And he has, although this uh, replication was from the 1970s, he has uh, given us materials and he has guided us and he has given us again and again feedback on, on this. Um, so I-10 is 358, H-index is 118. If we don't know the difference between them, I'll just reiterate. So there's like 358 publications that have more than 10 citations. This is I-10. What is an H-index? H-index is somebody who has 118 publications that have more than 118 citations. So that's a lot of publications for a very high uh, count of, of citations. So definitely one of the pillars in judgment and decision-making he took a slightly different direction from Kahneman and Tversky. He wanted to focus on medical decision-making on real life applications. So we'll see Fischoff again and again. We have actually done, I think five replications of his work uh, overall. Um, so what was this uh, article that I asked you to assess whether this will replicate or not? One major difference between historical and non-historical judgment is that the historical judge typically knows how things turned out. Um, and then uh, he had a bunch of, uh, yeah, as a result, they overestimate what uh, would, they would have known without outcome knowledge. So we have two different conditions, one where the result is known and one when the result is not known. 
And then we compare between these two. And it seems like when the results are known, it seems like people assess this as if they knew this all along. So whatever the outcome is, they would say this is uh, not surprising. When asked to predict what the result would be, people vary in all sorts of ways. But when the result is already known, the people adjust their preconceived uh, you know, assessment of whether something um, is, is likely or not. If you look at here, this was, I think, already from a few years ago. If you look at the number of citations of this article, it has 3,000 citations. It's definitely one of like the highest cited, aside from like prospect theory and all the Nobel Prize winning stuff from Kahneman and Versky. This is like one of the one of the top. So I ask you to try and assess this based on very little information. Do you think this would replicate or not? But there is a twist to that. I'll come back to uh, the twist. Before that, I'll tell you about the second assessment that you were asked to, uh, to do. Uh, the author, the first author, Baron and Hershey, is Baron, Jonathan Baron. Have you heard of this guy? Who heard about this guy? Never? He's currently the editor of a journal called Judgment and Decision Making. He has single-handedly created this society, been the editor since the beginning of time. He's also around 80 years old, I think. He's been trying to retire for a very long time. And the amazing thing about him is that there's lots of amazing things about him. Uh, but he has been, I think, the uh, longest running open science advocate that I know in that on his website, he has always shared both the materials, uh, the data, and the R code, uh, even before R Studio. And R was just like very difficult to do. He always shares everything. It's not, it looks a little bit like old school. Uh, it doesn't have all the latest uh, things, but he did the journal by himself, uh, doing all the PDFs for other people by himself, editing by himself, creating all this by himself. And I think somewhere last year he gave up, <laughs> says I need to retire. And then for reasons that I don't understand, he handed the journal over to Cambridge uh, Press, who is, uh, that is now managing the, the journal. How prolific he is he? Very close to uh, Baruch Fischoff. You can see the H index and I10. We've also done about five or six replications of uh, his work. And what you can see here is also the very uh, highly cited. Uh, Bauer Fischoff is from the 1970s, 1975, and has 3,000. This is a little bit more modest, but compared to a lot of other things, especially when it comes to experimental work, this is really um, outstanding. Um, what he said, which is a little bit different from hindsight bias, is that it also matters uh, whether we see the outcome, whether the outcome was good or bad. So it's not just that there is an outcome, uh, but if the outcome was good, then we tend to assess the decision as being good. If the outcome is bad, it seems like we assess um, the decision as being bad. I'll show you what that looks like. But first, what I did with you is that I assigned you to two different conditions. So basically, I was trying to see whether you would have hindsight bias over the replicability of hindsight bias article. So to some of you, I said, Fischer found, ta -ta 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 -ta. and then I told you, in autumn 2019, students in my courses completed a replication. The outcome of our replication study was a failed replication. So half of you received an outcome and the outcome was a failed replication. Here on the foresight condition, half of you did not see any outcome. And what I wrote was students in my courses are going to conduct a replication of the classic fish of 1975. How likely do you think would it be for us to have a successful replication? And I wanted to see if I split you into two conditions in a between subject design, whether you would assess the replicability of Fischhoff to be different just by seeing the outcome. So if you see a failed replication, perhaps you would perceive the replication likelihood to be lower. Is this clear, the experimental design? Yeah. Do you have any predictions of whether this would replicate or not? How many of you are familiar with the concept of power? Power, have you heard of it? Power, yeah, somewhat. What is the power that we have here 
to be able to detect an effect. How many of us here? 20 something, maybe a few more on Zoom, 25. Is this high power, or low power? What can you detect with this kind of thing? How would I know? How do we know if we are able to detect something? Scared to say, make a mistake? Yeah. Um, in order Please. to uh, do the power analysis, mm. we need to mm. estimate or just adopt the actual effect size. Mm. Uh, uh, like capacity equals uh, 0 0.2. Uh, yeah, just um, estimated mm. or the uh, observed effect mm. size from the prior research. Right. And another parameter we uh, we need is mm. um, the achieved power that we want to uh, that we want to get. Yeah. Uh, what is the range possible? Um, above zero point eight. Uh, yeah, the acceptable power. Okay, most people nowadays getting better at this, aiming for at least 80%, 0 0.8 power, right? Where we aim to get as high as possible given resources and what the, uh, what we can run. Where the highest is, of course, what's the highest? Can never really achieve 100%, but like very close to 100%. We want to get as close as possible uh, if we can. But of course, this is a judgment of resources invested. Do we want to invest all these resources? The higher it is, the more likely it is that if there is an effect, in fact, we'll find it, right? This is great. What kind of tools have you ever used to do power analysis? G-Power 3.0 version. Okay, yeah, G-Power. How many of you have used G-Power before? I'm familiar? Okay, great. So you're familiar with G-Power. Uh, why use G-Power? What's great about G Power? Um, so uh, it's easy to start because uh, actually, actually, you need to uh, know three parameters. Uh, one is the experimental mm. design. Mm. So um, uh, the data is uh, to be uh, analyzed by using ANOVA or mm. key test or repeated ANOVA, etc. And different analysis protocol will uh, yield different power. Mm -hmm. So uh, experimental design and estimated mm -hmm. uh, or expected effect size and uh, uh, the power that you want to achieve. Excellent. Yeah, good. So let's say that we want to do this. I have G power here, right? And we want to try and assess uh, what's going to happen with borrow fish halves uh, hand side bias. What, what should I do here? So you mentioned we have some estimate of an effect. How would we know what to punch in here? Uh, just use like um, the T value or some other statistic that can be uh, transformed into a uh, standardized uh, yeah. effect size. From where? Where should I take this T value? From, from the paper. From the paper, from the target article. Yeah, yeah. it seems like uh, uh, easy, but some people are just like, we, we don't know, maybe this one, maybe a meta-analysis. Okay, so we look at the target article. We want to see what the effect is over there. And then we put it here somewhere, right? Let's say, let's say it's not the right uh, answer here, but let's say that the effect was 0 0.5 coins D. What do I do with the G power? Um, where do I go? I have t-tests. You said we need to select the right tests. In addition, we have all sorts of other things, chi-square, we have f-tests for our novas or mixed and all that, right? And then here, instead of a correlation, we need to find, so we have two different conditions and we want to see what the difference is between the two conditions. So we have the foresight and the hindsight. So we have two independent means from two groups, right? But then there's like a bunch of things here that I'm uh, not exactly sure what they mean, right? So let's look at this. What is tail? So we have one tail and two tail. One tail is if I have a predicted uh, direction. Two tail is if I don't know if it will go this direction or that direction, which one should be higher than the other, right? Since this is a replication, we're gonna use one tail because we know which direction it should go, right? Um, and then 
I told you, let's assume that the effect size is quantity of 0 0.5. So we just put the 0 0.5 here. Alpha is, um, you know, the, the, other part, the other part of uh, power, they always go in like uh, combination. So typically we look at, we want to detect an effect uh, using p-values, no hypothesis significance testing, lower than 0 0.05. So this is a very typical one. If for some reason we have multiple hypotheses, so we're doing multiple comparisons, or in this case, we're running a bunch of uh, studies together, maybe we want to compensate for this. So like the easiest compensation is that, let's say we have three studies, we just divide 0 0.05 by three, something like that. But in any case, usually we can keep this as 0 0.05. Then we have the power, you mentioned 0 0.8, right? 0 0.8. And then, um, yeah. We can do all sorts of other things. So for example, if we have the means and standard deviation, we can calculate, uh, like let's say Fischhoff, he did, definitely did not report effect size, but we can look at the means and standard deviations and put this here, and then it will give us the, uh, the coins D. Once we have all of this, we press calculate, and then it gives us all these results over here. And it says in order to detect a coins D of uh, 0.5, we need two conditions, 51 participants in each condition, right? Yeah. So in this classroom, we have a problem. We don't have 51 for each condition, right? So the likelihood of us detecting this effect seems very low. How do we know? This is the, this is the side for telling us how big of a sample we should aim for. But here we know what the sample is. I now want to know what kind of effect I can detect in this classroom. How do I do this? What other hidden options are there in G-Power? But typically the complementary to power analysis is a sensitivity analysis because sometimes after exclusions or we aimed for a large sample, but what can we do? We had limited time or many people didn't come. And Finally, we have a, a limited uh, sample, so we do a sensitivity analysis, and we want to know what is the largest effect, the uh, smallest effect that we can detect with a certain sample. So in this case, we have, I don't know, 10 in each condition, aiming for a power of 0 0.8. The effect needs to be 1.15, right? It's a very large, almost unreasonable effect size. Last week, when we did our, our assessments, we saw a Cohen's D of one point something, and we already said this seems too big. Because if we look at Cohen's D, Cohen said that 0.8 is a strong effect. Then I showed you the effect size guide that we have, and then we saw that it's something like 0.6 in social psychology. So this is almost double. So in this classroom, very unlikely that we'll be able to detect a between subject uh, design effect. Okay, I just want to clarify this before we go and look at the results. Need to keep expectations low. All right. Okay, so we understand this. Good. So we discussed the power, we discussed the sensitivity, we discussed a little bit of G power, saw a little bit of a demonstration, and we understood that in this classroom we have um, low chances of detecting any effect. What was the Second one, Baron and Hershey. Again, I randomized you into two conditions. One of you, as one half of you, saw a negative outcome. One half of you saw a positive outcome. Right. So this is the manipulation that I did in autumn 2018. This is actually real. We actually did run this. Uh, the outcome of our replication was a failed replication. So this is the negative outcome. And then asking you to assess how likely do you think it was to have a successful replication to begin with. And then I also add the instruction of answer as if you don't know the outcome. Okay. Then I ask you to assess two things. First is the likelihood. Second is the quality. So just knowing what it is that you know, what is the quality of the replication? Here on the right side, we have the positive outcome condition. The outcome of our application study was a successful replication. And then I wanted to see whether there's going to be a difference, whether you saw this outcome or that outcome. Okay, is the manipulation clear? In the first one, it was about hindsight versus foresight. 
seen an outcome and not seen an outcome. And in this one, it was whether we saw a negative outcome or a positive outcome. Before I share the real results, now that you've seen everything, what is your estimate for whether things are going to replicate or not? So in terms of Fischhoff, I'm not talking about our replication because we have very low power, but in the real replication that we ran, how many of you think that Fischhoff 1975 hindsight bias will replicate? Raise your hand. Uh, about half of you, okay. How many of you think this would fail? Fail? Some of you, a little bit less, okay. How about outcome bias? How many of you think the replication was successful in our big replication? Raise your hand. Successful replication of Bayer and Hershey, a few of you. How many of you think, a little bit more, okay, good. How many of you think failed replication? One, just one, okay, good. How to decide when you raised your hands and said this is going to be a successful replication, how did you decide this? Why? Based on what factors? How to decide this kind of thing? Please. Without a lot of information right. in the test, yeah. so I guess anecdotal experience I've read. Mm just like a lot of other papers on these topics. Mm -hmm. And we learn about them in like undergrad psychology class. So mm -hmm. I would assume that it's, you know, like a solid enough outcome mm -hmm. that to be, that it could be taught in classes and like have so many other studies being done on it. Oh gosh, so, I really hope so. Yeah. yeah that's why but I, if we talk about something, it's solid enough, right? Yeah, yeah good. Say. Yeah. yeah to be Good. Yeah. So we have some assumptions based on our experience, our exposure to this, right? Almost a little bit hopeful. We really hope that this will replicate. So maybe that's driving something. Anything else that dro drove your intuitions? May I ask why you thought it would fail? Like, what's the what's the deal? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because I chose to replicate it. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. I have a critical mind, yeah. So I look for articles that are likely to not replicate, that kind of thing. Mm. So based based on what you know about our replication, if you know, um, do you know our replication success rate? Of all the replications I've ever done, do you know what the success rate is? It's very low? Okay. Okay, good. Some assumptions there, gut intuitions, but I love this. This is actually a really good, interesting example. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, I, actually, who knows what is our replication rate? I mentioned this very, very briefly in the first one. You don't know. Okay, that's actually a good thing. Good. All right. Um, let me first show you what happened in the classroom, um, which is uh, a little bit like <laughs> surprising because we also had a very small sample uh, here, uh, 10 and seven. And you can see that even with a 10 and seven, um, with a very small sample of students, you can see big differences between the foresight and the hindsight uh, with negative. So foresight said replicability would be like 37%. But when I told them that the success, um, you know, when we ran this, it was not successful. It was a failed replication. That people said, yeah, the success rate, even if we were supposed to ignore the outcome, the success rate that we expect is 7.8. So at least it seems here in these replications, hindsight bias seemed to replicate. Very small power. So don't uh, know if this like would be significant because we only have like five in each condition, but already like an interesting trend, right? The trend goes in the right direction. How about outcome bias? Half heard the positive that this is, would be a successful replication. So they estimated this at about 48%. And those who saw the negative outcome estimated this at 28%. So with a very small sample, running this in advanced social psychology undergraduates, seems like something is happening in the right uh, direction. This is what we eventually did publish in 2021. Those who actually saw the results, uh, I uh, actually, um, uh, all of that is true. 
However, I was not completely honest about the, the outcomes. So half of you saw that the replication was a failure. However, in both of these articles by Fischhoff, uh, one of them uh, with another with Slovic, Paul Slovic, another big name in judgment decision making, actually, these are very uh, consistent and strong effects. So you can see all of these are uh, undergraduates at HKU. Uh, this is the teaching assistant, uh, Boli. And Jiang is, uh, did a PhD with me uh, at HKUST in management. She's now a professor in Manitoba. And she guided the students. She worked with them, went on the Google Doc, gave them some advice. And after all these teams finished their work, she came in, took the lead, and wanted to help us submit this to uh, this journal, Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. However, she comes from the management department, like me, a business school, where they don't really like replications very much. And even then, back then, 2021, we weren't sure if Journal of Experimental Social Psychology will uh, accept this or not. So Jane wanted to run a third study. Um, first, you'll see uh, that in study one, we replicated experiment two from Fischoff and found support for Hansard bias in retrospective judgments. In study two, we replicated experiment one from Slovic and Fischoff and found support for Hansard bias in prospective judgments. So we had two different kind of effects, replicated, consistent, fairly, fairly strong. In study three, we found strong support for Hansard bias regarding perceived likelihood of the replication of Hansard bias. So Jane was worried that the uh, reviewers from Journal of Experimental Social Psychology are going to say, of course, this would replicate. Everybody knows that this is going to replicate. It's these classics. We heard about this in school, in all the classes. Of course, that this would replicate. We wanted to show the reviewers that if you already see the outcome, this uh, affects your judgment. So we preempted this. So Jane constructed a third study, a conceptual replication, where we asked them, we just ran this fish half. Is this going to replicate? Yes or not? Half of them would see the outcome, half of them wouldn't. And amazing is that she was able to really show this with uh, these kinds of effects. So Cohen's D almost up to one, which is a very, very strong effect. And you can see this here. We have the foresight condition. We have the hindsight condition with success. And we have the hindsight condition with a failed replication. So overall, foresight, if you just ask people, do you think this is going to be a successful replication, yes or no? People thought we're kind of like optimistic, uh, saying it will be like 65%. But then people who already saw the outcome and were asked to ignore the outcome, if the outcome was positive, they adjusted this to 73. If the outcome was negative, adjusted this down to 50. So the nice thing about this is that once we submitted this and we showed the reviewers what it is that they can't say, because this would show hindsight bias, they had nothing to say. So I think this is a great demonstration by Jane of how you can preempt what the reviewers might say, run an experiment on this and demonstrate that to them. A very successful replication of Fischhoff, also regarding the replicability of Fischhoff. So hindsight bias is alive and well, yeah? <clears throat> Implications for science, and one of the reasons why we do registered reports. So registered reports hide the outcome. There's a reason why we want to hide the outcome, because if people see the outcome, they say it's not surprising. Whatever it is that you found in terms of replication, we knew this all along, or people adjust back um, the, the assessments of quality. How about outcome bias? This was just... Um, yeah, so this was just uh, published this year. It took us a while from 2018 until now for all sorts of reasons. But once again, you can see we have two uh, students, we have the teaching assistant, two others that join in um, and all that. What happened in that um, paper in Baron and Hershey is that you had a patient and you had a physician that needs to make a decision about a patient's uh, health. Should you do this treatment? Should you do that treatment? What we uh, manipulate in these cases is that half of them um, saw half of them saw whether uh, it was a success, so whether the patient survived, and half of them saw whether the uh, patient uh, died, and then whether the decision was by the patient or by the doctor. And as you can see here, 
at least um, you know from from our sample when we reran this, you can see Cohen's d of about uh, 0.77 or Cohen's d of 1.1, very very strong effects. And what I can see is that when we have success, which is the right ones over here in orange, much higher about the quality of the decision when uh, it's a success compared to when it's a failure. So when people see the outcome and see that the patient has actually died, when you ask them, how uh, good do you think the decision is? People say it's much worse if the patient died. But the decision was actually the same across the two conditions. So what the outcome is actually should not have any uh, say regarding whether the, the decision was, was good or not. So hindsight bias, uh, this is the replication. And then what was the extension? We added perceptions of responsibility, whether they're responsible or not for the decision. And then we also added outcome importance and then showed uh, smaller effects, but also, um, yeah, successful across the board for both patient and physician uh, across all the DVs. So uh, Baron and Hershey, successful replication um, with, with all sorts of uh, extensions. And of course, for us, uh, I think it's also uh, relevant for science. So we have this obsession with seeing p-value lower than 0 0.05. So we want to see that the predictions were supported because if they were not supported, then maybe you're incompetent. Maybe you don't know what you're doing. Maybe the quality is, is not as good as if you found a p-value lower than 0 0.05. If you found support for a replication, perhaps you're a competent replicator. If you didn't find support for a replication, maybe you're incompetent. So just by seeing the outcome, people readjust their evaluations of the quality and of the people who made, who made the decisions. Is this clear? Does this make sense to you? Yeah. So both of these reinforce the need for us to consider registered reports. Because register reports, there are no outcomes whatsoever. So there's nothing to readjust back to say people were incompetent, the quality is not good, or it was surprising. It was not surprising. We knew this all along, right? So this is why it's very, very important. Let's say that we completed a manuscript and we already have the results. What's a good way for us to avoid hindsight bias and outcome bias? What can we do? Let's say that you're the editors of a journal and you have a lot of submissions and you want to make sure that the reviewers don't have hindsight bias and outcome bias, what would you do? Hide the results, terrific. So you just send them the introduction and the methods without the results or the discussion. And then ask them, is this a good plan? Yes or no? And then if they don't know what the results are, they just need to assess the science. So you address the, the outcome bias, right? It is quite amazing because until now, on Twitter, now turned into blue sky, we still have discussions of whether this is true or not. So a lot of senior scholars disagree with me on this. They say, no, in order to assess the quality, we must look at outcomes. It's amazing to me to see this kind of debate back and forth with senior scholars uh, regarding why they think this is important. Uh, so it's worthwhile to go and check out some uh, other opinions out there. I just want to tell you uh, that I strongly believe that this is a problem and I try to show this kind of uh, evidence. Um, yeah, so the main thing I wanted to take away from that is that we can actually use judgment decision-making or social psychology in order to understand us scientists and how science works and why we actually need registered reports, okay? Any questions about this? What are the usual arguments they brought up advocating for it? Like they need to see outcomes before assessing it? Yes. They say if something didn't work, then it's no value to us. We want to see whether something is valuable or not. We shouldn't publish all the junk out there because a lot of things don't work. Why should we waste paper or PDFs on a website to bother everybody with noise about things that don't work? There's lots of problems with this, because if you only see the things that work, and there are a very low percentage of a lot of things that don't work, then you have a big problem because you have an overestimation of whether something works or not. Yeah. Uh, but these are ongoing uh, debates that I honestly find it very difficult to understand that point of view. 
especially given we just came out of a pandemic, especially given that we have all this evidence, especially given that we have replication crisis and all sorts of other challenges. But it's a... Uh, it's the way that it's been the whole time. Even now, when you submit to a, a manuscript to a journal, they don't hide the, the outcomes. They send everything to the reviewers. And many times, if you've gone through peer review, many times the reviewers go over the results first, and then they write a paper and then have a lot of things to say about the methods because they know what the outcome is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do you want to see the design? So we now understand the experiments. I want to show you how I did this because we're going to do this together on the third part. We'll get to the third part. But first I want to sh make sure that we all understand what this looks like on Qualtrics and how we can analyze that, okay? So I'll go to my Qualtrics. Of 27 responses, so we have like, I don't know, 13, 13. Good. So if you're not familiar with Qualtrics, uh, I went through this very briefly last time, but here's another chance for you to do this. I'll try to do this a little bit slower, but if you don't understand something, please uh, let me know, okay? I will actually give you a Qualtrics uh, template for your replication that has proven to work very well for us. So in terms of the consent form, in terms of the demographics, in terms of funneling and all that, I'm gonna do this for you. So we're not gonna focus on this now. Here we only had a consent form, but I didn't do any of these other parts that we'll get to afterwards. But just to uh, let you know that most of these things are completely handled by us giving you a template so you don't have to worry about these things. This is what Qualtrics look like. Let's go, uh, in order to understand things, the first thing that you wanna do is go to a survey a survey flow. So we see the consent here. This is the uh, block where you needed to um, say that you agree. And then we have a randomizer. A randomizer allows you to um, uh, randomly assign people to one of two, uh, or um, so this is like a between subject design. So one of um, depends on how many, but here we have two conditions. I usually tag this plus thing to evenly present elements because if some people drop out, then it could be a little bit misaligned. But uh, evenly present elements means that the uh, two conditions need to be about the same kind of um, participants. Then I grouped this a little bit. I didn't do this separately for Fischhoff and for um, Bauern and Hershey because I wanted those who see the failure to see uh, failure in both. And then the other one, I um, grouped the foresight and the positive success uh, together. So basically all of you first saw the hindsight bias and then you saw the outcome bias. Half of you were in the failed group where you saw failed for both of these experiments and half of you were in the other group that saw a foresight or a successful replication of outcome bias. This was the first one. So you saw one of these two. After you completed that, we had uh, three conditions of a robbery. And the three conditions uh, are routine, exception control, or exception no control. And I'll show you what the difference between these three are. Let's go into uh, these. A lot of students that I work with have a little bit of a problem um, with following best practices of how to do Qualtrics. And I think it comes back to haunt them after they've collected the data. So for example, if you do nothing with the Qualtrics, you don't have any meaningful block uh, names. So it's block one, block two, block three. And then if you start uh, variables, it will have uh, variable Q1, variable Q2, variable Q3. Once you download that data set, it's very, very confusing. Wait, what is Q4? From which condition? Where did it go to? What should I do? How to analyze this? And it would take you a very, very long time. Therefore, I try to lay down a lot of best practices of how to do Qualtrics well, so that when you finally get your data, you will know exactly each variable to what condition it um, uh, belongs to. So first thing that you want to see here, is that I give meaningful block names. So here you can see 
fish of hand side bias condition hand side uh, failed and then we have fish of hand side bias condition foresight and then for outcome bias we have condition negative and condition positive and then for the three robbery routine robbery exception control and robbery exception no control so the label for the block is really important so that when you share this with the reviewers, they'll know what each condition does. When somebody else from your team or when I or Christy go over the call tricks, we'll know what this condition is, not that it's just like block one. When you go into the blocks, you'll see that I really try to name every variable in a meaningful way. So for example, HB, hindsight bias, belongs to the uh, hind condition and what the dv is is success the success rate right and then you can see that over here compared to uh, this one over here hb foresight condition and success this way when i see the export and i want to know what each variable is i know it it's very very clear so whenever you do call checks please use variable names okay in addition, you'd want to do all sorts of other things. So for example, I always force here, you have add requirements, I force the response in order to make sure that I don't have any missing data. It could be sometimes that people just press next, next, next because they want to get through this, especially when we run the replications online on Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific, many of them just want to get through this as fast as possible. Also, another thing that you may have uh, noticed, especially in the third, the robbery one, this is also a replication of a classic experiment from the 1980s, but they did not have comprehension checks. We added comprehension checks. We wanted to make sure that those who see the scenario actually read it and understood it. So you can see that after there's the scenario, you ask this in order to make sure which convenience store, store A, store B, which convenience store, and then finally uh, did or did not lose um, his right arm due to the gunshot wound. Now, for every one of these comprehension checks, we actually force you to answer this correctly. The way that we do this is that there's a validation where you cannot proceed to the DV without confirming that you've actually answered this correctly. This is very, very important. Some people, and I understand there's a, a whole debate about this, some people don't do that. They do a manipulation check afterwards. Sometimes they do exclusions based on that. I, especially with MTurk, especially with Polyphic, want to make sure that everybody really read this and understood this. Therefore, we do comprehension checks. In the review that we got, we submitted this only with this, with the comprehension checks. The first thing that they said is, you've changed the, the target, you've added comprehension checks. Therefore, you created the effect superficially, artificially, right? They asked us to rerun this again. We ran this again, got exactly the same results without the comprehension checks, but it became a little bit more messy because it seemed like the effect went a little bit uh, down and the noise was a little bit uh, larger because some people don't pay attention. Since then, this was in, nine, uh, not 19, in 2017. Since then, in many of our applications, we do comprehension checks. So you have two examples of no comprehension checks. So basically here, there's a scenario and then there's a, um, an, a DV. But in the third one that you did, actually you had to go through comprehension checks in order to get to the DV. Is that clear? Do you understand? Yeah. Okay. All right. Another thing that you want to do, aside from forcing the response in order to make sure that you don't have any kind of uh, missing data, is to um, let me see where I did this. Yeah. So, for example, here, uh, when we do comprehension checks, many times we also randomize the order of the choices. So you can see here. So there's display uh, answers in random order. This is just in case, um, you know, if there's a certain pattern of, you know, if they uh, just uh, select all of them in, in a certain, so maybe they just select the, the left one. So we want to make sure that they need to kind of like pay attention to this. 
And especially we didn't do this here, but if you uh, randomize all of these, it becomes very difficult for them to get this by random chance. Another thing that you'll notice is that in each one of those, there's a recode values. So if you go here, recode values, for each one of those, there's recode values. The, reasons one, the reason why you would want to do that is that Qualtrics messes things up many times. If you delete a choice, you add a choice, it jumps from like one to three to seven. This way, you know exactly what the result is, one, two, so forth. And then you make sure that you know exactly what uh, each uh, one of them stands for. So zero is one, 100K is two, and so forth, okay? So always record values. Now you m might ask yourself, okay, um, understand there's all these kind of things that I'll probably forget tomorrow, so uh, what do I do? So the good thing about this is that if you go to the resources uh, on my website, we actually have a Qualtrics guide for this, which of course, if you have some other things that you want to contribute, it's collaborative, you become a co-author, like everything else, so forth. So we have a collaborative Qualtrics guide. So over time, every time I needed to correct something in students work, I just added an additional um, thing there. So when you submit your own replications, I would ask you to go through this list in order to make sure that your Qualtrics uh, adheres to these uh, guidelines. So you'll see here, there's Qualtrics survey design checklist. So of course, uh, check the spelling and grammar, file name, how to engage with participants, meaningful block names that we talked about, meaningful variables names that we talked about, how to do it, uh, formatting, how to do copy paste into Qualtrics, and so forth and so forth, yeah? Uh, Christy was very nice in transforming this into a very easy Excel uh, Google Sheet. So you'll have something to help you just make sure. So when you will submit these things, you will have to confirm that you've done each and every step. I just wanted to show you what are the best practices in a demonstration that we do in class so that everything is clear. I cannot emphasize this enough because I've seen after 120, 150 of these replications and so many projects with students, all this is based on real things that got really messed up with people not following the guidelines. So it's very important that you follow uh, some of this. So I'll share this Qualtrics checklist. Uh, I'll embed this in the in the guide, and then you'll be able to uh, use that. All right, so typically what we do, let's go back to the survey, yeah. So in order to prepare the pre-registration, what I typically do, like I showed you in the second session, is that I go to tools, I go to generate test responses, and then I just generate a lot of responses, which basically what it does is that it, uh, it um, avoids all the checks, all the comprehension checks, and just gives, uh, whenever you have a DV, it gives a random answer. It simulates an answer. Uh, and if you do nothing, then it's supposed to be completely random, random noise. After I did this, I simulated, I can't remember how many, I exported this, and I exported this to this file over here, which I'll share uh, later with you. 610 survey class uh, demo. If we open this with PSPP, you'll see that this is what it looks like. So now that you see the data set, it becomes very clear. I don't know how much you can see there. I don't, can I make this a bit bigger? I'm not really sure. But in order to see my variables, it's very important that they have good names. So now it's very easy for me to find, oh, hand side bias, hand side condition, success, DV. Now I can see all of them together. In addition, you'll see also a bunch of things from Qualtrics. So for example, start date, end date, and you'll see like timers for the clicks and all sorts of other things. You'll see the quiz in there. So this is what this looks like. If I want to do something very fast for class, I want to get initial results very fast. What I usually do is that I load these things into Jamovi which is what I did over here. So basically I load the empty SAV, the, the randomized uh, simulated data, 
And then I start very, very, very quickly to uh, do all the analysis. You can see there's like nothing in the analysis because all of this is random data. Then what I do is within R Studio, I start an R Markdown file. I'll share all of this together with you. So it's this R Markdown. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. And basically you'll see that after you have the template, um, which all of you can just like copy paste, you'll see that I load the file, which is very easy to load. I have all the different uh, variables that I define. And then the other things are just like copy paste from, from Jamovi. So fairly easy and straightforward. If you don't know how to do all these calculations, um, how to do transformations, how to prepare all sorts of things, that's uh, completely okay uh, because uh, we have a guide for that. Or you can do this with, I uh, don't know if you have access in Hong Kong, but with the chat GPT. Some of you came to me and said, but we only know SPSS. Actually, if you take an SPSS file and tell chat GPT to transform this to R, it does an amazing job. You don't need to think about this anymore. Do you want to see this? Should I demonstrate this? Okay. So in order to be able to connect to ChatGPT, I need to open a VPN because for some reason this is blocked in Hong Kong. All right, we'll connect to Switzerland. And then um, let's see. Um, what's the name of the SPS, right? SPS is a, yeah, all right. So let's say I have this file here. Yeah, so this is actually a real a real uh, thing that we did. We, long, long time ago, I did the project in SPSS before I knew anything about R. Um, I did, I did uh, an analysis of the world value survey. World value survey has been collected for 20 years each year from a lot of countries around the world. Now it has a lot of really interesting things from demographics, social class, politics, like whatever you want. You also have something that I used to do a lot of research on called personal values. There's a circumplex of personal values. There's like 10 categories that fall into four higher uh, order dimensions. But what I can see here is a lot of SPSS code, right? So basically what you can do is take this, S so I'll just tell you what this SPSS code does. It says, please compute security, which is the mean of these variables, uh, var variable five and variable 14. And conformity is variable seven and uh, variable 16. Very bad code, don't learn from me, don't use SPSS, this is very bad. I did this seven years ago, sorry. But you can, uh, and this is part of the amazing thing about ChatGPT, um yeah let's go to uh, what was it yeah chat open ai let's hide this you have chat gpt4 and you have advanced data analysis which is over here and then you can ask him should we be polite yeah please <laughs> convert this spss syntax to our code and then I'll just like write the whole thing down. Now I'll give it a second. And it really tells me like everything that it does. It even adds like comments on top of it. It's just like unbelievable. So if you want to really improve your code, even just add comments because you don't have time to write comments, just go to ChatGPT and do this. And it's really amazing because this code just works out of the box. I did not have to do anything when converting from this to this. So it's just unbelievable. R used to be a little bit complicated. It's no longer the case. You can do like unbelievable stuff with this. Uh, if you want to do plots, it will create amazing plots for you. So for example, yeah, I did like uh, reliability calculations, a bunch of other stuff. You can basically like take this whole code, put it into R Markdown, and it will just work. 
If you're in Python, it does amazing Python to R conversion. If you're in MATLAB, it does amazing MATLAB conversion. Like whatever you're with, this will save you so much time, right? So don't worry about this. Uh, any questions about this? Something that you want me to show you about the chat GPT R capabilities? Do you want to try this out with something just to see the power of this? Let's say um, using R code, conduct uh, one way ANOVA of tooth growth data set with post hoc contrasts. Okay, let's see what happens. Yeah, it's definitely part of the base R data set. So you can definitely use that. He tells you exactly what it's doing. Here is all the, you just load it with data. Yeah, you run the ANOVA with AOV. This would work, this is amazing. And then it even runs the code for you in order to show you what the results are. It's that good, finished working, show work. Yeah, hold on. Oh, it did some, okay. It's even improving on it itself, that's amazing. Now it's doing the post hoc. So it, it's like performing all the post hacks now. Now let's say that I want to like have a really nice plot, right? So I want to write, um, please do a nice violin jitter dot uh, plot of the, of the ANOVA of tooth growth. I, it's a little bit like lame. I hope you understand that it understands it. Yeah. So it loads all the packages, it creates the violin plot, it will even, I think we even show you like what the results is, are, what it looks like. And then uh, you can, um, actually, do you wanna see if this runs? Are you curious? You can copy the code, go here, our script, run this. Oh, I need to load the GG, okay. Um, please re require library. GG plot, yes, thank you. Okay, ta-da! <laughs> it's unbelievable. Do you want anything else? Do you want a rain cloud? Let's do a rain cloud. Oh, amazing stuff, amazing tool, highly recommend it. Uh, what you can do uh, is either use the 3.5 from HKU, or I strongly recommend that you ask your PI or the advisor. It costs something like $20 a month. You can do this per lab. You don't have to bear the costs yourself. This is what I do, and I share this with the rest of, of my students. Uh, completely worth it. You know, every, every second that you spend on converting SPSS to R is just a waste of time. $20 a month for this kind of magic. Is, is worth it. So what we'll do is that we'll take a 15 minute break. And while you're on break, I'm going to take your data, download this, and then when you come back, I'll have the results for you. And then we'll discuss how to do the rest uh, with the hackathon on extensions, okay? All right, so basically what I did was just to download the Qualtrics file uh, into a file called real data, which Firefox always likes to add this, like duplicate, anyway. I loaded this, knitted the whole thing together. And then this is what came out. So this is like our, our results. So we have 27 participants. These are the descriptives for hindsight uh, bias. Um, actually, yeah. So what you can see here, we have descriptives for all of these uh, three experiments and then we have the analyses. I'm just gonna like jump straight to the end. Uh, you can see here, in terms of null hypothesis significance testing, you can see like the effects are not really there. So in hindsight bias, uh, in terms of p-values, it's not really, we don't see uh, much uh, in this uh, nice plot. Uh, foresight and hindsight, um, you know, very, very small differences that are not detectable by null hypothesis significance testing. However, with outcome bias, you can see that even with our very, very small sample, we were able to detect this and the p-value is below 0 0.05. And if you look at actually the means of these two, the positive one you've adjusted, if you were in the positive condition, you've adjusted the likelihood of replication up. And even if you're in the negative, uh, a little bit lower than that. And if we run this uh, analysis and we put this into like a nice plot, then what we can see here is that the Cohen's D, the hedges G, um, 
which is Cohen's D for adjustment for small samples. You can see the differences between these two, the p-value and the effect size is actually quite large. It's close to one, right? So outcome bias definitely seems to be uh, detectable even with a very small sample like our classroom. We had two DVs, one is likelihood and one is quality. In terms of quality, perhaps because we ran the replications, you did not expect any differences in quality, which is good, that's good. Um, yeah, so these are the two that we already discussed, hindsight bias, outcome bias. So what is this third one? Uh, first of all, questions about this? Is this clear, like what I just showed you? Yeah, so with one DV in outcome bias, we found support despite the very, very small sample, and the effect size was close to one in those, right? Um, but I think it's an interesting demonstration because you got to leave this as participants, you got to see this, you got to um, go through the Qualtrics together with me, and now we were able, uh, during the recess, the break, to analyze this uh, together. So I'll make all the code, everything that I've done, don't worry, everything is going to be uploaded to the OSF, so you can learn from this for your own, um, for your own projects, okay? Yeah. So what's the third one about? Where did this come from? I wanted to share this one with you because this is the first replication that I ever ran in my life. It now seems um, almost, uh, you know, a long, a long time has passed since then and I've done so many replications, but in 2017, I actually did not have a clue on what a pre-registration or replication looks like. I didn't even know where to start. What I did, I was a postdoc in Maastricht University, and I've heard all sorts of things about this open science, whether I should do this or not. I decided to put everything that I was doing aside and say, I have to understand what is this thing pre-registration. I have to understand what are these replications. I'm going to start doing this with, um, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a try. How to do this? In my second year as a postdoc, they gave me students, uh, master students, um, to do a thesis with me. And what I did is that I announced, I, sh I should um, tell them what is my topic. And I told them, the only thing that I will consider doing with you is two, two things. You must do these two things with me, a pre-registered replication and a pre-registered meta-analysis. I did not have any clue what those things mean. Um, and the nice thing is that there's a large pool of people in the faculty and only four students chose me, but they chose me as the first and only priority, which was very surprising to me. I wasn't even really sure why they did that, but I think there was something about this that seemed ambitious to them that they also wanted to understand, even though back at the time, we weren't really talking about replications. The first uh, person, I'll talk about the other ones later on. The first person was Lucas, Lucas Kutcher. So we're talking about a master's student, a one-year master, master's, and he came and you know, tried to discuss with me, what should we do our replication on? And I decided to start with the simplest thing ever, just like the scenario of the robbery that you just did. It's a vignette. You manipulate whether somebody had control or didn't have control, whether they went um, with their routine or they did an exception. So I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a second. I just want to say, then in this replication, we decided to do uh, three different scenarios. So we're testing the exceptionality bias that people tend to attribute something different to an exception compared to our routine. And we had three different scenarios. Two we took from Kahneman and Miller, 1986, um, which is a very, very well-cited um, review article about norm theory. I don't know if you've heard of norm theory. But I don't know, thousands of citations. It's a review, it's, it's not so experimental, but we took the demonstrations that they had in the review. And then we went to this Miller and McFarland 1986, which had this robbery scenario and the compensation DV that you just had. Um, the thing that was really uh, interesting is that um, Lucas came to me and he said, you know, I read these articles I'm uh, very curious about this, but one thing doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because in these two scenarios over here, what they measured was the regret. So if somebody was robbed during a routine, 
they tend to regret this less than if they took and went to a different store that they usually don't visit. So if there's something exceptional about the behavior and something bad happens, then people tend to regret this more. But it wasn't clear to Lucas why here suddenly they used compensation. Because compensation seems to involve a lot more than just regret. Norm theory is about regret, but here instead of regret, they, uh, they did compensation. So Lucas asked me, why don't they measure regret? And I said, terrific, let's do both. First, we measure what it is that they did in the target. Then we go to the second page where they can't go back. And then we also measure regret, which is exactly what you did. First, you answered the question about compensation. Then you move to the following page. And then you were asked about regret. OK? Now, what was interesting about this, so I'll just show you the, the scenarios. We had three different, it's a little bit small, so I'll read this to you. Everything is the same, only in the routine condition. He visited store A, which he frequents. He visits this more regularly. In the exception control is last night he visited store B because he wanted, he was, it was under his control, so he wanted the change of pace. And when it's not under his control in the third condition, it's like last night he visited store B because store A was temporarily closed for renovations. And then something bad happens. There's a robbery. Uh, how much would you compensate them for losing their arm in the robbery? And how much would you experience regret? This is how I usually explain this kind of setup to students. And this is what we're going to do. This is the simplest experiment possible. So basically, we have uh, two main conditions. We have exception and we have routine. And we have a bunch of DVs. So usually, I give this kind of table. Experimental, con uh, experimental condition one, experimental condition two, whether this was between or within, what is the title, and then what was manipulated. So what is the change in the scenario? And then the dependent variable, what is the measure name and what is, it, what is the specific um, way to, to measure this? So for example, here, did I not change this? Sorry, so I, I thought I, I changed this. This, is, this includes the, the regret part. So here you see the routine. Last night he visited store A exceptional. Uh, last, last night he visited store B because he wanted a change of pace. And then you have the DV, you label this like regret. And then you say, what is um, what are the different uh, measures for this? Now the question is, what kind of extensions uh, you can do? So Lucas said, I just want to add another DV. I want to add regret because when I read the theory, it seemed to be about regret, not about compensation. But actually, there are three different extensions that you can do, very, very uh, simple extensions. In order to have a contribution, you don't need to have something completely new, completely novel, completely out of the. It's very risky to come up with very novel and very extreme extensions. You can start from something very simple. So in our extensions guide, which you can follow from this link, you have uh, the choice between three different uh, extensions. A very straightforward extension is to say, I don't want to touch the experimental design. I have routine and I have exception. I don't want to touch this, but maybe gender, maybe age, maybe some people like routine more than they like a section. Some people have inclinations for taking action. Some people have inclinations for not taking action. So one thing that you can do is add an individual difference predictor, which is what you see over here before the replication. And then you have uh, another type of extension, which is adding another uh, condition. Could be that there's something that wasn't tested. Many times, a lot of experiments actually don't have a neutral or control condition. And another kind of extension that you can do is to add a dependent variable. So in Lucas' case, there was compensation, and he added the regret to this. Um, let me see. Yeah. The bottom line from this replication attempt is that we were able to uh, replicate the ones that measured regret, but we were not able to replicate the ones that measured compensation DV. Um, typically, if we would try and submit this to a journal, they would say that maybe we did something wrong in the one that did not replicate because it's very well known, very well cited. We have uh, all kinds of um, outcome hindsight bias. But what's interesting is that all the extensions that Lucas added actually were successful. 
So when we measured regret, actually we found an effect. So if we measured something that was more in line with the theory, then we were able to show that effect. So compensation did not work as well as regret. In addition, Lucas added a bunch of other things. So for example, he measured social norms, negative affect, and perceived luck. How lucky is this person? And it seems like the perceived luck between the routine and the exception uh, does, does vary. So it's very interesting to see that when he had a replication, and all of you have a replication target, Lucas was able, just by reading the articles very closely, to come up with some extensions that would help clarify the effect. So even if compensation doesn't work, what might work instead? And in this case, it is regret. And regret is better aligned with um, Kahneman and Miller, the other things that did, that did uh, replicate. So what does it look like with our design uh, table? Yeah, here, here was the compensation. Okay, so I forgot to, okay. So here we have the routine versus exceptional. We have the compensation over here. And typically I give students, undergraduates, when I give this kind of exercise is, um, please add your extension. You can decide, you can add a, um, individ individual differences or you can add an experimental condition or you can add a dependent variable, okay? What does it look like with what Lucas just did? So you can see um, measuring something like action state orientation scale, something that's well validated in the literature that comes before. And then he added exception, but no control. The store was just closed. And then he added regrets on top of that at the end. Okay. So in this case with Lucas doing one of three, you don't have to do all three. You can choose whatever you want, whatever type. But he added all three, and then we were able to find some very interesting insights to that. So what we're going to do today is that I'm going to give you this design, exceptionality effect, and I'm going to ask you to sit with your team and come up with the best extension that you can. What is missing? Or what's interesting for you? Or where do you want to take this? I know this is not developmental, this is not educational, this is not clinical, it's not your domain, I understand this. But think of this as just another classic that you've learned about that is in the books and something that you would want to explore more. What is interesting here? What can you see that hasn't been tested? And try and come up with another condition or another DV. I would much rather that you do another condition or another DV than another individual differences because individual differences always have something. There's always demographics and there's always action orientation. You can add a bunch of that, but there's a reason not to do that. It really complicates the, the, the design. You need to do on Cova, you lose some power, you do all sorts of things. Um, try not to do the first type. Try to focus on either adding a condition or adding a different DV that's not compensation or not regret. Okay, this is going to be a uh, um, the exercise that we do. Why is this important for you? I know that as uh, MPhil, PhD, um, PsychD, you think that getting a publication is very difficult. Uh, back then, one of the first things that Lucas was asking me, we sat down in the lab meeting and he said, I really wanted to do a pre-registered replication and meta-analysis with you, but is anybody going to care about this? And back then, I did not know. So I said, I have no clue. How about we go on ResearchGate? And you write, before we collect the data, before we had pre-registrations, just tell the world what you want to do. This is what he wrote. The aim of this project in February 2017 is to conduct a pre-registered application and meta-analysis on how past behavior norms affect regret over negative outcome, which is the exceptionality effect. A month later, so you can see this here, March 27 in 2017, Sander Kuhl, who is, has been the editor of Cognition and Emotion for the past six years, wrote this on Lucas, a master's student, wrote this on his research guide saying, Dear Lucas and Gila, that Cognition and Emotion, where I am an incoming editor, we are seeking to publish more pre-registered research. Please consider Cognition and Emotion as an outlet for this project. But what was interesting is that after Lucas finished his project, we submitted this to Cognition and Emotion, and it finally got published. This is the first replication that we ever did. 
we had two uh, different rounds. The main feedback that we got was about the comprehension checks. You added comprehension checks, you should take them out, rerun this, we did this, we got exactly the same results, and then finally this was enough. So we have two successful replications of what Lucas found. No support for compensation, but there is support for regret. So if you're thinking, who wants replications? Why should I do this? All these silly extensions, routine, exception, a scenario, vignette, why? This is why. You don't know the value or the problem, you know, who's interested in this and until you, you post this, until you do this. If you're not sure, just ask. Go on ResearchGate, post this. Go on Twitter or Blue Sky and post this. You'll be amazed how many people want more replications, more open science work, want to validate. And especially here, we were able to find something that didn't work in the original compensation, but did work with an adjustment with regret. When we reached out to authors, different authors that did exceptionality effect, and we said, you know, something very strange happened. We did not find support for compensation, but we found support for regret. What do you think about this? And they said, yes, happened to us too. We didn't get support for compensation. We tried to submit this to the journal. The journal said no. So from 1986 until Lucas in 2017, nobody ever tried to just run the same replication and submit this. The few that did got rejected. So now people need to know, can you imagine just all the people that tried this with compensation and couldn't find this uh, to make this work? Not only with you think, okay, maybe Lucas is like an exceptional student. No, with almost every student that I had back then in Mastria. So Yajin, Tijen, and Yajin also did replications and extensions and meta-analysis with me, also went on ResearchGate. And this editor writing comments, asking, please submit to us. We're seeking to publish. So you've got editors out there that are looking for you to do more open science, pre-registered and replication work. There is a need for this right now. So if you're hesitant about this, just go and see what is happening out there. I did not anticipate this. Sander Cole is very active on Twitter. You can ask him. He will tell you if he's interested in you submitting to him or not. He's very interested in register reports. Some of the interactions that we had is me trying to convince him to join peer community in register reports. Finally, because he didn't just do a replication, he also did a meta-analysis. So a great thing for you to do in your first year of a PhD we start with a replication and a meta-analysis, and you will see the kind of insights that overlap in order to give you an understanding of what you want to build your research on. So here, in a meta-analysis, you can code all the effects for regret and all the effects for compensation. And suddenly we see when we look at the literature is that the effect for regret is almost double that of compensation. So the reason why you can't find compensation is that you need much bigger samples. You need much higher power. You need to be more powered in order to detect that effect. But there is a difference because regret and compensation are two different things and compensation has a bunch of other things that are in there. So a replication shows that if you just try and do compensation as is, uh, it does not, it's not detected, but if you do regret, it does. A meta-analysis allows you to see the average effect size. But you can see the number of studies is actually very, very small. We need more studies on this. But overall here, you can already see in terms of the p-values and in terms of the effects is that there is support for regret being uh, a lot larger than compensation. Is this clear? Is it clear the value of doing replications and meta-analysis is a first step for you? Yeah. All right. So now we have about uh, less than an hour, like 45 minutes in order to uh, do this exercise together. In your second task, after the RR assessments, we're going to write a replication and extension together. I want you to start thinking, what is an extension? What is interesting? How to design this? How to do this? So as a first step, for the first 20 minutes, what I want you to do is go on this Google Doc. The Google Doc, after you scan this, I will open this. The Google Doc has different sections for different teams. Choose one of them, replace the name of the team with your name, add the uh, team members, and then you'll see the design table. You can decide 
which condition you want to add to the routine the exception or which DV you want to add. I want you to have like a conversation. And finally, come to a point where you've agreed on an extension. After you've agreed on an extension, I will add one of you to the Qualtrics and all of us will work on the same Qualtrics together to add all of your extensions. And then I'll ask you to vote on the extensions and the best extensions I will actually run with a real sample. Is this clear? So if we open this, this is our hackathon now. 6010 week four hackathon. This is what it looks like. Designing extensions. You have team red, team purple, gray, whatever that is. And here you can see the design. Don't touch the routine and the exception. Don't touch the uh, regret or compensation. I just want you to sit down, talk about this and add this in the Google doc. Then we'll have like five minutes of going through this. You can decide which ones, and then we'll add all of this to the Qualtrics, okay? In your section, give me one person who has a Qualtrics account that I can collaborate with, add as a collaborator on my Qualtrics, okay? So we're almost at 4.30. Let's do until 4.50. Get together with your groups. Decide what kind of an extension you want to do. I will put on the design of the, yeah, here. Good. So here you can see routine, exception, compensation, regret. You can learn from that. Think about this. See what you want to do. If you want, you can even open the, uh, the target article, but it's not needed. Just think what is interesting for you, okay? So until 4.50, get together with your groups and start working on this. Any questions? Everything understood? 20 minutes, do your best. I think it's about time for us to move on to the Qualtrics to wrap this up. So the email that you gave me, what I did, just so you understand how this collaborative magic thing happens, is the, in the Qualtrics, I have tools and collaborate. And then here I can add your emails and then just press save. And then you get an email inviting you to this. And then later in your Qualtrics account, you have shared with others. Now you need to handle this very, very carefully. When you collaborate with others, any person can mess up everybody's work. So typically, I would strongly recommend that you have one person in the team that does this. But here we have a number of teams. So I'm curious to see how that would work. What I want you to do now is all of you go and work with the one person on his laptop to see how to do this. Now you have either another condition or another DV, right? I suggest you first start from another condition because that's the easiest one to do in a collaborative Qualtrics. What typically you need to do is go here. Which one do you want to base your um, design on? So you go here, you do copy, and then add here the new condition name, uh, name or label. You create this, you copy that. There's a new condition that has everything that the other one has. You would want to write the variable names and all that. And then here you will go and you will change to your manipulation. If there's another DV, do the DV only in your added condition. Don't try and mess up with everybody else's, okay? In your uh, um, condition, just write team X, okay? Just so we know which team this belongs to, all right? Is the collaboration on the Qualtrics uh, clear? Try as fast as possible to transfer from what it is that you did in the collaborative document to the collaborative um, Qualtrics. Now, let's see what is it that you did. So we have Team Red over here that added, I can't really see from the design, what is it here? Okay, attribution of change of routine, external versus internal. All right. In terms of the dependent variable, also emotion, anger and guilt, so not just regret. Interesting. Purple, we have an experimental condition about the safety of routine and exception location. Hmm. Okay. 
And then in terms of the DV, um, yeah, regret we already know. What else? Responsibility. Okay. Team Gray has, let's see what's going on over here. Monetary incentive. Okay, because it had a 50% off voucher. Okay, so there's a reason for why you deviated rather than change of pace, you wanted to uh, save money, right? And then third party sympathy. Okay, that's interesting. Green had something to do with uh, having requests from another. Somebody asked you to deviate. So there's a reason for the exception. Interesting in accountability, good. Brown has prior information. Uh, what does that actually mean? Informed crime rate. Ah, okay. Whether um, it's more expected that if you deviate, you'll be faced with higher crime rate. All right. DV here, ratings of the shop. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Just always to make sure that the DV is something that can be measured across all the three conditions. Last one, orange. We have a rewarding event. Uh, went to store because there was a big sale. So a little bit related to the 50% uh, off, but like a slightly different twist to it, right? So very interesting. DV is still yeah. working on it. All right, great. I think we have like really interesting extensions. Well done on this. Now let's try and within 10, 15 minutes, transfer everything to the Qualtrics and then we can summarize the, the hackathon. In terms of the dependent variables, you don't touch the compensation, you don't touch the regret, you add the page break, and then you add this in the following page, okay? Don't touch regret and compensation. This is an extension. It's amazing what can happen if we have a clear goal, if we have the tools, if we know what we need to aim for, right? If we have guides, something as simple as this, highly cited, thousands of citations, there is something that's already out there, you can build on that and very quickly add extensions. So I hope it gives you it gives you a little bit of um, more confidence in what extensions look like, in your ability to, even without reading the article, knowing nothing about the literature, coming up with some cool ideas, putting this together into first a table and then transcending this to a uh, Qualtrics. So just like last time, I took your Google sheet and then I added a bunch of stuff, worked with Christy, to make this a little bit more uh, um, higher quality. Uh, we'll do the same thing with the Qualtrics over here. Another thing that I wanted to add, I don't know, I'm going to check this, but I, I do want to highlight this. Team Gray went over what it is that I already had in one of the conditions and noticed that there was likely a mistake. I don't know what caused this mistake. It could be very possible, but it also appears in our original um, replication. It would be a little bit odd because we found the effect over there, so we would need to verify this, but if this is true, it does not change the conclusions of the, um, the results, but it is a mistake. So definitely a compensation if I find this. I just want to show you why it's important that you visit, revisit, do workshops on your article <laughs> so that other people will check it. Why it's important to have other people invited to go over our stimuli. So this is one of the things that I hope that we can learn together in the importance of visiting, revisiting, doing replications, sharing materials as much as possible, because it's very likely that something out there has issues. So thank you for that. I'll look into it, I'll get back to you on this. So I don't know if you have like a good, um, um, a comprehension of what you just went through within uh, three hours. So we started with you participating, you taking part in hindsight bias, outcome bias, making some predictions, having a hypothesis, then seeing whether we were able to replicate this yes or no, and then being able to see your own results, seeing that at least even with a very small sample here, we were able to replicate outcome bias in terms of one, one DV. Then you saw the value in doing pre-registered replications, adding extensions that might add all sorts of insights. Some things might not replicate, like for example, compensation did not work as expected. But then if we add something meaningful like regret, perhaps shame, guilt, whatever, anger, or whatever it is that you added, perhaps we'll have an additional insights that can extend the literature. So there's something very powerful 
you know, replication and extension. You don't need to go all the way and do everything novel from the very beginning. You can do a step-by-step -step and you can arrive at good designs with high quality design with research questions very, very fast. And as you can see from the Lucas case, there is interest in this. People want for you to submit this to them. It does add things to the literature. Good. So reflect on this. Think about this. I'm going to work a little bit on this. I'll ask uh, Christy to help me with a little bit of that. And then I'll update you uh, next week. For the main uh, hackathon that we'll do, where we will conduct a pre-registered replication and extension, I will ask you later in the week to do the reading before the session so that when you come, you'll know what it is that we're doing a replication of, OK? So expect a Slack notice uh, from us in order to tell you what it is that you need to read for the main hackathon. Any questions? Everything clear? All good? Something you want to ask? No? Good. Thank you for participating in the second hackathon. I'll see you next week.